Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, as Katie said, to our sponsors, and I want to give a special thanks to our team. Uh, thank you guys for working so hard, not only in the passionate, dedicated work that you do in our research and clinical care, but also in putting things together like today. I think Katie would be the first to tell you that we need everyone to do this, and we appreciate all your hard work. And thanks to my colleagues who are speaking uh, in today's program. I, I hope that everyone is uh, as excited as we are to launch into some uh, serious learning this morning. Uh, we hope to mix it up with some stories of uh, people that are part of our program that um, you may or may not um, feel similar to, but we try to weave some of that in with the science as well. And then we're delighted to have Cindy Cordell here today to give our uh, keynote lecture in the, in the middle of the day. Uh, and you'll, I think, really enjoy some of what she talks about in terms of the global efforts to try to combat these diseases. Uh, and then this afternoon we have the focus group sessions that Katie will tell you more about later. And I want to give a special shout out to Katie for all of her tireless effort to put together group, uh, uh, events like this and many other events that bring our community together. So please join me in thanking Katie Brown. So I'm going to uh, talk about FTD and try to weave in uh, some references to Alzheimer's disease today because I think that the more that we learn about these conditions, the more that we learn that all of these neurodegenerative diseases are related to each other in one way or another uh, and there are lots of ways they're related that we don't understand yet biologically, but in the ways that they affect people, uh, there are so many universals, there are so many things that people go through. Uh, in one form or another, no matter which of these conditions they have. And I think that's a lot of what brings us together in the needs that we have in trying to live the best quality life we can in spite of these conditions. So partnerships are key. Uh, you'll see pictures of, of Rare Disease Day. Um, partnerships and the power of stories in your newsletter. We're honored to uh, have had several uh, members of our community share their stories. Uh, and it, it takes courage to do that, so thank you for doing that, uh, Chris and Bob and others. So please, uh, one thing that we encourage everyone to do is if you want your voice to be heard in, in any way, let us know and we'll work with you to try to figure out how to make that fit with your uh, uh, approach to telling your story because each person and family counts when it comes to, to raising awareness <coughs> Excuse me, and helping everyone connect with uh, each of us who are living with these conditions. So there are a variety of conditions that are associated with cognitive decline. So if a person has problems with their thinking abilities that they've developed, it could be because of medical conditions, it could be because of psychiatric conditions such as depression, anxiety, um, more serious conditions such as bipolar disorder, uh, conditions that people may think of as uh, in the uh, interface between medical and psychiatric like sleep disorders. So uh, we always take those kinds of things into account when we're trying to evaluate why someone has problems with their thinking that they didn't used to have or with their mood or personality or behavior. And then there are a variety of neurologic conditions as well, including of course brain tumors that can uh, slowly affect people's language skills or thinking abilities. Uh, brain trauma, uh, the effects of head injuries, brain infections, which uh, sometimes are, are devastating and sometimes are much more subtle, uh, stroke and variations on the theme of stroke, and then the thing that we talk about the most, which is neurodegenerative diseases. But I think it's important to acknowledge that there are all of these different reasons that people can have changes in their thinking abilities, and we always have to start by uh, doing a comprehensive survey of, every, of, of each patient's medical conditions and their background in terms of what they've lived with. Once we get into the um, neurodegenerative diseases, um, we have the gradual progression of, um, of these disorders that start out by affecting the brain um, in ways that I'll talk about as we uh, discuss things this morning that are considered to be the pre-symptomatic stages when the brain disease is starting to affect the brain but people don't yet have symptoms. At some point, they start to have what we call prodromal or mild cognitive impairment type symptoms when they're still independent but starting to have uh, symptoms that are affecting their day-to-day -day functioning and eventually dementia that has uh, a whole series of stages. 
So uh, this is due to the gradual accumulation of certain neuropathologies in the brain that I'll touch on as well. And increasingly, we're trying to separate the uh, clinical from the pathological uh, uh, aspects of these diseases as we learn more about how to measure them in living people. So um, I wonder if Andrew could help us with the projection a little bit, because we've got uh, a screen size issue that seems to be cutting off some of this. I'll, I'll move ahead anyway um, while we, we wait for a little tech help. Um, so at the top here uh, that's cut off, it says global clinical or functional status. And so some of you have heard us talk about our current approach to the, uh, what we call the diagnostic formulation of these conditions. We think of three steps that should be considered. First, what's the overall status of the person in terms of their independent functioning? And I'll unpack that in a moment. And then second, what's the specific, what we call neurocognitive clinical syndrome that people sometimes uh, give labels to, like behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia or primary progressive aphasia, but sometimes we just have descriptive terms like an amnesic and disexecutive dementia, which I'll also define in a moment. So that's really telling you more specifically about the person's symptoms. Um, the first level tells you about their overall independent functioning ability. And we get that information from interviewing the patient and people that know the person well and finding out about their symptoms in daily life, often having people fill out scales. Uh, and then we get that also by measuring people's abilities on testing, neurologic exam, psychiatric interview, neuropsychological testing, and some other approaches that you'll hear from our colleagues about today. And then the third step is really what's the brain disease uh, or other condition or, or contributing conditions that we think might be responsible for causing these changes in people's abilities. And we'll talk more about how we measure those things with imaging uh, and other methods a little bit later. So the, the first step, the overall clinical functional status, is really defined by the loss of independent functioning due to people's overall level of cognitive impairment. And what I mean by that is, is we all hope to be cognitively normal, as long as we can be cognitively normal. Um, some of us have subjective cognitive decline. Many of us have subjective cognitive decline. Um, you know, when it comes to getting older, I think most of us sooner or later feel like our memory or whatever function is not what it used to be. Um, most of the time, that might just be part of normal aging. Sometimes that's the very beginning of what turns out to be a specific condition that we can try to understand. But it's often very ambiguous. And it basically means that people don't yet have any detectable impairments if you test them. Mild cognitive impairment, on the other hand, is when people uh, have impairments on testing, but they're still, and symptoms that are consistent with that, but they're still independent in their functioning in day to day life. I think it might need to be scaled uh, on the laptop, Andrew. Yeah. Do you mind seeing if you can work on the display? Sure. So, <clears throat> So the, um, when the definition of dementia is really when a person has lost some independence in their daily activities. And that's such an arbitrary thing, depending on what people were doing when the disease started affecting them. So uh, if a person is working at, 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 at an age when they would be working in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, when, whatever age that is, and they can't work anymore, by most conventional definitions, that's when uh, you can define a dementia. They're no longer able to do their occupation because of the effects of the disease on their brain functioning. Um, but they may be very normal seeming in all other ways. So I think it's, it's important to say, okay, that might meet technical criteria for dementia, but that's a very, very mild stage. And they may be completely independent in many other aspects of daily living that aren't as complicated as their occupation was. Uh, so, so that, that's really kind of uh, right at the border line, at the border zone between mild cognitive impairment and dementia. But that's what we mean when we're talking about people losing independent functional abilities. Um, maybe if you can do the next slide, it will sure. help. And, and then there are more and more severe stages as we progress through dementia that uh, come on at, at different rates for different people. And this is a lot of what we try to do in our assessments with patients and families is to help them understand as best as we can understand it where the person's, uh, where the person is in, in the progressive loss of these kinds of functions because that really dictates 
what kinds of support they need, um, whether it's at home or in trying to do some of the community activities outside the home. And so the, the levels of independent functioning can be thought of as uh, advanced activities of daily living, and I know this is hard to see at the moment, so I'll just uh, talk about them. Instrumental activities of daily living and basic activities of daily living. So the way I like to think about it is if a person has uh, real needs for help with basic activities of daily living, that usually means that they're in a moderate to severe stage of dementia. Those basic activities of daily living are eating, grooming, bathing, uh, walking, toileting, and those kinds of things. Uh, the level above that is instrumental activities of daily living, and that's really things like managing medications, uh, handling basic household finances that aren't that complicated, um, getting from one familiar place to another, making food, some kind of meals, shopping, using the telephone, and so forth, using the microwave. Um, so those are instrumental activities of daily living that, generally speaking, um, are not that complicated. Um, thank you, Andrew. And then advanced activities of daily living are, and, and so if people have problems with instrumental activities of daily living, we usually think of them as either in the moderate or sometimes in the mild uh, dementia stage, depending on how much trouble they're having with those kinds of things. In the mild stage, people can have trouble with these so-called advanced activities of daily living, like performing at work, um, or performing mental tasks that are involved in their former job, handling more complex finances like tax, tax records, business affairs, investment decisions, holding positions of leadership and being active in those positions in community organizations, um, paying attention to and really engaging in and understanding and being able to discuss a movie or a play, um, participating in complex games, navigating to unfamiliar areas, uh, and so forth. And we're increasingly developing instruments to um, mostly have uh, you guys filled those out in relation to what functions a person is doing independently, what functions they may need a little help with but are pretty independent at, versus what functions they really no longer are able to do. And uh, there are efforts to try to develop um, methods to measure people's performance on these things. So one of our colleagues uh, at Mass General has developed a, a, a telephone um, uh, sort of mock um, uh, bill paying or credit card paying app. So you have to go through the menu and push the buttons and respond to the automated robot on the other line, just like you would have to do if you're trying to pay a bill by phone. So there are efforts to try to develop more objective measures of these kinds of functions uh, that we could use to monitor people's uh, change in a more uh, direct way, rather than just getting reports from people about them. So uh, that's really the different levels of uh, independent functioning that define this overall functional status um, first step in the, in, the, in the diagnostic discussion. And that's why we spend so much time talking with people about what they used to do, what, what they're still doing, what they're having trouble doing, and so forth. And that obviously is very personalized, and the, the um, instruments that we use don't always fit. You know, when you're filling out the questionnaires, people often say, well, this isn't really representing the things that I'm doing in my life, and we know that that's a challenge, and so we try to personalize it by interviewing people uh, to supplement those kinds of questionnaires. And then in thinking about the cognitive behavioral syndromes, I like to just try to match them with the domains of, of cognitive and, and uh, emotional function. So first we've got attention. Hopefully everyone here is feeling attentive this morning, and. Uh, following what we're doing so far, uh, but there are problems with that that can occur in the setting of a neurodegenerative disease, and they can in some ways be similar to what you can see in children or adults with attention deficit disorder, but in some ways they can be different than that. Um, but that's really what you might call a, an inattentive syndrome, um, where the information is just not being processed in uh, the way it used to be. And then there's executive function, which is uh, the little CEO inside of our brains that helps us uh, get to places like this, plan our days, and uh, um, Katie's got a really high functioning one to plan an event like this, so we're, we're happy with, with her executive function. But a lot of people have, have dis-executive syndromes um, that uh, uh, make it hard for them to get things done that they used to be able to do, and um, that's a very common difficulty uh, that people can have if you just watch how they're carrying out their day. Then there's language. Megan will talk about um, the aphasic syndromes that affect people's language, and, and those can be specific or they can be um, uh, part of other conditions, part of, part of 
uh, when people have problems with other functions. Then there's memory, uh, which is referred to as the amnesic syndrome. And that's really what most people think of when they think of typical Alzheimer's disease as making a person not be able to remember things that they did recently or experiences that they had recently. Um, so a lot of times when people have a progressive syndrome involving memory loss, people just say, well, that's Alzheimer's disease. But actually, um, Alzheimer's disease usually uh, affects memory and executive function so that people are not only not remembering, they're also not getting things done in the way that they used to. And that's often the typical form of the way Alzheimer's disease affects people uh, in terms of their functioning. And then there's a much less common uh, set of problems with visual cognition. So our brains devote a lot of real estate to processing what we see. Uh, and so you can have problems with identifying objects or people, and that's called a visual agnosia, where you don't understand what things are that you're seeing. Or you can have problems with the way you process space around you. Uh, and so those are different parts of the brain that can be affected by some of these conditions. And then there's social and personality. So a lot of times people refer to this as a behavioral syndrome. Um, but when we talk about behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, there are very specific changes in people's behavior that tend to be uh, what we mean when we talk about people as having that kind of a, a, a syndrome of, of symptoms. And then there are changes in people's mood that are much less specific and seen often in multiple different neurodegenerative diseases that, that we often refer to as anxiety or depression, but they also often don't really fit into those categories quite as neatly as um, uh, sometimes when people just have a depression by itself. So when you have a mood disorder in the context of a neurodegenerative disease, it can often be more complicated and harder to label as simply depression or simply anxiety. And sometimes that's irritability, um, where people just are, have short fuses, and that can often be difficult to separate from the frustrations that many people experience when they're living with something like this and losing some of their independence. So that can be very challenging. And then rarely there are um, problems with basic sensory motor functions that we often refer to as apraxia uh, and that you can see in conditions like Parkinson's disease, uh, but sometimes in conditions uh, in the FTD spectrum or atypical Alzheimer's. And so sometimes a single one of these domains is the main problem, and so we call it primary. Uh, but a lot of times it's really multiple domains when, where people are having difficulties, and so it's, it may be that a certain um, problem like language is the predominant problem, but there are also problems maybe with executive function or memory. So that, that's some of what we try to sort out when we spend a lot of time interviewing people and testing them to try to see uh, which of these areas is compromised and if, there are, if there's more than one. So I wanna just um, step back for a moment and say that across the United States, there is a network of about 30 centers that are called Alzheimer's Disease Centers that are uh, funded by the National Institute on Aging. Uh, John Groudon started our uh, Alzheimer's Disease Center in 1984 at Mass General. Um, it was one of the first five uh, funded back when there were only five. And there have been 30 now for a couple of decades. And there's a big network of, um, of efforts that we do in collaboration with each other to try to both understand these conditions and develop efforts to try to treat them. And so when people talk about the Alzheimer's Disease Network or the Alzheimer's Disease Centers Program, they are also referring to the related disorders because there's a big emphasis within not only our group but others around the country on frontotemporal dementia, progressive aphasias, uh, atypical forms of Alzheimer's, and the whole spectrum of these conditions, Lewy body dementia included as well. So I think when we sometimes hear about the Alzheimer's Centers or the Alzheimer's Project Act, we have to keep in mind that it's also the related disorders and, and I think Katie will touch on that uh, later today as well. So um, I wanna just briefly mention a few facts about frontotemporal dementia, recognizing that not everybody here uh, is, is dealing with that, but um, I'll also mention early onset Alzheimer's disease as well. So um, frontotemporal dementia is thought to be the third most common neurodegenerative dementia after Alzheimer's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies. Uh, maybe five to 15% of everyone with dementia has FTD. Um, Alzheimer's in its typical form affects maybe around 5 million Americans. FTD is thought to affect fewer than 150,000 or so, maybe even as few as 50,000. We don't really know because the diagnosis is so challenging that we think we're probably underestimating it, but it's by any definition a rare disorder. Uh, but that's probably approximately the number of Americans under the age of 65 that have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, 
So uh, that can be a difficult di thing to differentiate. Um, and we know that even though Alzheimer's is very common, when people get it at a young age, that's a pretty unusual situation uh, and often requires completely distinct resources and uh, efforts to try to treat and, uh, the patient and family and support the family than in what you might think of as more typical Alzheimer's. But at the end of the day, a lot of people and families with these conditions need similar kinds of support. And so I think we, we can think about all of the efforts of our uh, sponsors and others here as really uh, helping to uh, helping the ships float a little higher regardless of these condi which condition they have. So FTD usually strikes people in their 50s or 60s. It's maybe thought to be more common than, than Alzheimer's when, it's, when a young person gets dementia, but that's also not so clear. We've seen people as young as in their 20s and as old as in their 80s, uh, which is about the experience of the international community. So um, just because someone is, is um, older doesn't mean that they don't have a form of FTD. Just because someone is younger doesn't mean that it must be FTD, uh, because Alzheimer's can strike at a young age as well. So I think it, it really um, you know, doesn't tell us that much if someone is younger and has one of these conditions. What we want to know is what's the flavor of it, what are the symptoms the person has, and how does it affect them. In FTD, maybe a, up to a third of cases have a positive family history, and maybe 20% or so, 15 to 20%, uh, have a uh, genetic inherited condition. That means about 80% don't, uh, and then most FTD is sporadic, just like with Alzheimer's disease. We don't know why people get it. It isn't probably that strongly genetic, um, and uh, Diane Lucente, uh, our senior genetics counselor here, uh, is, would be, I'm sure, happy to chat with anyone about that, and will be on, in the panel discussion with me this afternoon if people want to bring questions about family history, risk, and genetics uh, to, to today's discussion. So in 2011, uh, the major types of FTD got a revision uh, in terms of their diagnostic criteria. Uh, and so we, we, we talk about behavioral variant FTD as uh, a syndrome that affects people's personality and social interactions uh, as its primary um, problem. So disinhibition, which can be socially inappropriate or uh, otherwise inappropriate behavior that is basically the person not stopping themselves, not having a filter. Uh, you can see that in other dementias, but if that's a pr prominent early feature of someone's condition, that may be BVFTD, as it's called. Apathy is common, and that's true in Alzheimer's as well, but sometimes in FTD, apathy is very prominent, and people just don't have the spark to get up and go much. Loss of sympathy or empathy is uh, the thing that really can affect family members a lot when their loved one is not responding emotionally in the ways that they used to. That can be a major issue. Repetitive or compulsive behaviors uh, can, can also be challenging to deal with if people are um, starting to do things that are collecting or organizing or, or even simpler things like tapping that they didn't used to do. Uh, and sometimes it looks like they're anxious, but a lot of times if you ask people, why are you doing that, they just can't really tell you. And then there are changes in eating and drinking behavior. Sometimes people um, uh, have it develop a, a new sweet tooth Sometimes they have a particular, somewhat rigid um, set of preferences for certain kinds of foods that they want to eat frequently and repetitively. Uh, other times they'll, um, we've had people that start smoking. Um, that we had a physician actually that we worked with who uh, was a staunch anti-smoker uh, campaigner in her professional career and, and then started smoking as part of an early uh, feature of her FTD. So these kinds of, um, what are often called hyper-oral behaviors um, can be very um, hard to understand and often not something that people think of as typical of someone with a type of dementia. And then executive dysfunction. So these are the, the major features of behavioral variant FTD and people don't always have every one of them. Uh, and some of what we try to do is help people understand uh, what these symptoms are and, and where they're coming from in the brain and the fact that for most people with these symptoms, they really have no control over them and may not even have awareness of, of much of, of what has changed. So lack of insight is also a very common problem. Megan's going to talk about the progressive aphasias, um, and we try to categorize people into the one, one of the major uh, forms of, of these, but they don't always fit. Um, but Megan will, will get into that in her talk after mine. So in, in terms of progression, uh, FTD tends to start distinctly as one of these variants. 
Um, not always. Um, sometimes people come in with both language and behavioral symptoms, and it's hard to really pin them down in terms of one of these categories. Um, but it usually progresses to involve other domains, so many people with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia will develop language problems, and many people with uh, progressive aphasia will develop behavioral problems like what you see in FTD. So these are things that we try to monitor for and help people anticipate as we begin to see hints of them, or sometimes if people don't have any of those, we can be reassuring about the fact that we don't think those are likely to emerge over the next year or whatever time frame we're talking about. And then depending on the type and location of changes in the brain, you can have changes in people's movement abilities as well. It can look like Parkinson's or look like uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, uh, or, and can sometimes lead to falls and can sometimes be a major source of disability. So uh, those can occur and those are also things that we monitor for very closely and uh, try to reassure people about if they don't have any of those, uh, recognizing that that, that uh, really can change people's care needs. And unfortunately, FTD is a, a fatal disease, so when people are diagnosed confidently with FTD, just like with Alzheimer's disease, uh, depending on the age at which they're diagnosed, it would shorten their lifespan. Uh, and we don't always know what that's gonna be. Sometimes people progress pretty rapidly, but you can um, have people that pass away from the illness within two or three years, very rapid progression. You can have people live with it for 20 years. So it's quite variable, and uh, the level of function that people have is quite variable, uh, and that's one of the things that we really try to help people um, understand and anticipate as we work with them. The average survival is probably somewhere around a decade, um, but the earlier you get diagnosed, uh, the longer people can function, and often function pretty well for, for many years, uh, adapting to the situation. Treatments, uh, we don't have treatments to slow disease progression. Um, Dr. McGinnis will talk more about what we're doing to try to develop treatments to slow disease progression. Uh, right now we have treatments that can help people's symptoms, certain symptoms. They're not approved for FTD, but there are uh, medicines that have been shown in clinical trials to help with certain kinds of symptoms, like some of the compulsive behavior, some of the uh, disinhibited behavior. Um, we don't have much that we can do to help with apathy except for uh, um, activities. So we think of medicines as um, uh, a small part of the management uh, approach. Um, the comp comprehensive interdisciplinary team approach really with multiple different specialties, um, working with different uh, facets of a patient and family uh, to, to help them function as best as they can is really what we think of as the treatment that we can provide for people with these conditions at this point. And so uh, we put a lot of effort into that, and um, I'm sure that many of you that have been involved with us recognize that those are the things that, right now anyway, really can make a difference in people's lives. But medications can be part of it, and I think putting it all together is, is what we try to do to personalize the care plan for each patient and family. And we think that the Alzheimer's Association and other community organizations and, and um, uh, area agencies on aging and um, memory cafes and, and a variety of the community resources that are in many people's uh, towns are critically important to helping people connect with others and, and develop strategies for living with these illnesses and for uh, getting ideas about how to uh, um, bring, round out your team in helping the person and the family function as best as possible. And Katie will talk more about that as well. So I'm just gonna spend a few minutes talking about the brain diseases. So everything I've talked about so far was really the clinical uh, symptoms and signs and functioning that people uh, have uh, in, in their illnesses. Now what about the brain diseases? So there are, are, there's a family of these, and uh, we talk about FTLD, uh, frontotemporal lobar degeneration, as the disease in the brain, or the family of diseases in the brain that fall under this umbrella. Uh, and they, um, they really are not yet uh, that well understood. Some of them have only been discovered in the last 10 years, so it's really new information that's coming out. Um, Alzheimer's disease is the thing that, that people think about most commonly and that we have more tests that we can do for that, uh, markers of that disease. There's also cerebrovascular disease uh, and Lewy body uh, disease as well. And so sometimes we see that people have more than one of these pathologies in their brain that's responsible for their symptoms. So there's a lot of variability. I think if there's one theme in frontotemporal dementia or frontotemporal lobar degeneration, uh, it's that people are different from each other. 
we do the best we can to try to help everyone understand that and to try to refine our understanding of it. But you can always, uh, you can think back to uh, the idea of real estate when you think about what some of the variability comes from. So which parts of the brain are affected really is uh, what dictates the symptoms that people have. So this may not be very uh, easy to see, but if you have uh, problems in your uh, CEO, that's really kind of on the outside of your frontal lobe, and that would lead to problems with executive function. Uh, um, here, this is a side view of the brain. These are different MRI scans, and that's a front view, and this is a side view. And so if you kind of take out the right half of my brain and look at the left half of my brain, that's, that's what you'd be seeing there. And on the inside of the frontal lobe is an area that is important that I think of as the spark plug of the brain. It gives you the drive and motivation to get to things like this or to connect with others or to do the tasks you have to do to get through the day. And when people have problems there, that leads to apathy and loss of motivation. And then uh, if we look at another front view, so this is now uh, kind of right above my eyes here, what we call the bottom of the frontal lobe, and that's the brakes of the brain. So if people have problems there, they might be disinhibited, they might do things that are inappropriate, uh, might lose their filter, uh, and things like that. So there are different people have the disease start in different parts of the brain for reasons we don't understand at all. And the uh, thing that's really not easy to see on this slide that I'll show in another slide in a minute are the, if you have the language centers of the brain affected, you have these different aphasias. So in general, one way to think about it is on the left, in the frontal lobe, you've got the language center that helps you produce speech. In the temporal lobe, you've got the language centers that help you understand speech and language. Uh, on the right, you often have uh, many of these uh, same structures in the brain that are important for social, emotional, and other kinds of behavior. And for some reason, it seems that not only do, does, do these diseases start in certain parts of the brain, but they tend to start in one side of the brain uh, in some people, and again, we don't understand why that is. But on the left, you tend to get more language symptoms, and on the right, you tend to get more behavioral symptoms. So one of the types of research that we do is, is looking at um, measurements that can be made with computer processing of MRI scans. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll just show you a, a map of this. And what you can see is areas that are thinner than they should be. And these are two different uh, groups of patients that Megan will talk about in a minute that have semantic uh, PPA. And they, whether you, whether Marcel Mezalam's group at Northwestern which is the image on the right here, or our group at Mass General, scans these people and does these measurements, they have almost identical problems in the same parts of their brain. So the nice thing is that, that these criteria that we use to diagnose these diseases are pretty reproducible across centers, and that gives us a, a lot of hope for being able to um, develop tr studies that, of interventions like treatment trials because different centers can do uh, the same in terms of identifying these patients with these different disorders. So um, we also use, so that's MRI, we also use FDG PET, glucose PET, to measure functioning of the brain or what's called metabolism of the brain. Um, and these are horizontal slices here. At the top is the front of the brain, at the bottom is the back of the brain. And, and if you want your brain to be lighting up in these bright red colors, because that means it's active and doing all the things it's supposed to do. Um, if you have Alzheimer's, you tend to have dimmer or cooler uh, colors, so less function in the back of the brain, back here. So you might be able to see that the front is pretty red, the back has cooler colors, uh, less red. So that's typical of what you see in normal, regular Alzheimer's. And then with FTD, you tend to have problems in the frontal or the, or the front part of the temporal lobes, uh, like its name implies, uh, and those are often readily apparent on these uh, FDG glucose PET scans. And so it's approved by Medicare, this test is approved by Medicare for the diagnostic evaluation of people with these kinds of problems. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people who are of younger age um, can't get it because their insurance, even good private insurance policies sometimes won't pay for FDG PET scans uh, just by their policy, which we're trying to get changed, but it's, being, it's an uphill battle. You can also see that um, if, if you look at the, the images from a side view, so this is, uh, both of these brains are as if you're looking at them from this perspective. Um, and the front of the temporal lobe right here on this person's brain is a little bit low in its activity level. That would be mild, reduced activity, but look at all the red all over the rest of the brain. Uh, that person's brain is functioning pretty well except for that tip of the temporal lobe. This person has very little activity in the entire frontal lobes. Uh, and so it has much more severe reduced brain activity. And so one of the things that we use 
this kind of scan for is not just to diagnose the condition, but also to get a sense of how severe the brain function is compromised. And sometimes that fits with how people's functioning in daily life is, and sometimes it doesn't completely fit. So we try to use that to understand um, brain function. We're trying to use these so-called imaging biomarkers to make earlier and more confident diagnoses, maybe to predict progression, to monitor change over time, and ultimately to use them as outcome measures in clinical trials that we hope will enable us to say this medicine or other intervention is improving or stabilizing people's brain structure or function, and therefore uh, should lead to in, uh, at least stabilization or maybe improvement in people's abilities. We're not there yet, but that's part of what we use them for. So thinking about the pathologies uh, really gets us down to the brain cell. This is a, a schematic of the cerebral cortex. It's really about two to four millimeters of the outer surface of our brain uh, magnified through the microscope. And you see all these brain cells and their connections. And what tends to happen is uh, you tend to lose brain cells. So the pink, this is a microscopic brain slide. And you can see kind of a denser uh, purplish, pinkish color down here where you can see all these dark spots which are brain cells. Up here you see less dense um, pinkish purple and uh, some white spots where the brain cells should be but they're not right now. So you really lose brain cells and their connections as part of these so-called neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, and you accumulate abnormal forms of uh, proteins that should be doing normal functions in the brain. And we talk about these uh, uh, as uh, aggregates of proteins that are either inside of or outside of brain cells, that, and they shouldn't be glomming together like that. So um, in FTD, there's tau as one of the major proteins that accumulates and, and causes problems in brain cells, or something called TDP43. Um, and what we hope in the long run is that we'll have treatments targeted toward these specific protein problems that will help rescue the problem or help preserve the functioning of that protein within the brain cells for longer. With Alzheimer's disease, you've got amyloid, and that's specific to Alzheimer's disease, but Alzheimer's also has tau in a different uh, problem, uh, but the same protein, it's a different problem than what you see in, in the tau form of FTD. But the nice thing about that, again, is that efforts to target the tau problem in Alzheimer's hopefully will help us target the tau problem in FTD. And so again, these things uh, overlap, these different diseases overlap, and um, treatments hopefully that benefit one will maybe benefit another. So these are normal proteins and brain cells become twisted and tangled and we're trying to develop better um, molecular biomarkers either through spinal fluid or through different kinds of PET scans to measure these molecular pathologies so that we can eventually not just diagnose people more specifically but target those problems for treatment. And that's actively happening in the Alzheimer's field, unfortunately not, not succeeding yet, but um, uh, it's also beginning to happen uh, in the FTD field but we're quite a bit behind the Alzheimer's field but are being able to use a lot of the infrastructure and the approaches that have been developed uh, for that purpose. So this is a, a person that was initially suspected, a 62-year-old doctor who was initially suspected of having possible Alzheimer's, uh, but it turned out his frontal lobes had a lot of shrinkage. The front part of his glucose PET scan was uh, really reduced in its activity, um, and he had no amyloid, so this kind of faint blue image just basically says if you have a scan for amyloid in your brain, which we can do now with PET scans, and there's nothing there, it means you have no abnormal accumulation of amyloid. So this person can't have Alzheimer's disease in their brain if they don't have these amyloid plaques in their brain that we can measure with this kind of PET scan. So this is an example of how you can make a very specific diagnosis of not just frontotemporal uh, shrinkage and reduced function, but also the absence of amyloid. What we're looking for in uh, FTD is the ability to measure tau. And we thought we had it a few years ago, but it looks like the tau PET scans that we can now do are mostly useful for Alzheimer's type of tau pathology, and we need a next generation, which we're working on right now, of tau PET scans to try to measure the type of tau that we know accumulates in people with frontotemporal degeneration. So I just want to close with um, a, uh, an example of a person with a, an atypical form of Alzheimer's disease. So this is something that I haven't really touched on much, but something that we work on a lot as well as FTD. So this is a 78-year-old former professor who had gradually progressive visual and spatial symptoms, started to notice that she was missing things that she should have seen, some things that she thought she'd lost in her house, but they, she came back and they were right there on the table and she should have seen them. 
Um, she stopped driving, um, but she was otherwise intact in her daily functions, but she started having all these difficulties uh, processing what she was seeing, not being able to find things, and also having trouble recognizing familiar people by their face, including even her son, but when he would speak, he, she would know who he was. So it was a specific problem processing uh, people's faces through the parts of her brain that do that normally. And so because she was independent, we said she's got mild cognitive impairment, that's her overall global clinical status. Uh, her specific cognitive syndrome was a visual predominant syndrome, not a memory problem, so not amnesia. Uh, and sometimes that's referred to as a progressive visual spatial syndrome. More commonly, it's referred to as the posterior cortical atrophy syndrome, which is uh, something that can occasionally be caused by frontotemporal degeneration pathology, but usually is associated with an atypical form of Alzheimer's pathology in the brain. But obviously, the person is affected in a very different way than you think of as people with Alzheimer's typically being affected. So I'm going to show you a series of scans just to close out here. And at the top of the slide is the front of people's brains. And maybe could someone lower the lights for just these slides? Thanks. Um, so we've got two different levels. One of them is lower in the brain uh, at about where the eyes are. Uh, you probably can't see them right now, but maybe if we can get the lights lowered, um, and I might be responsible for that up here. No? Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. It's, it's, really, it's really dark, sorry. Um, but you'll be, you'll be really able to see this now. So here are the eyes, um, and here we're at a higher level of the brain, um, and you probably can't tell, but there's a little bit of shrinkage in both of these areas. But when we look at her FDG PET scan, this is the glucose PET scan, there are almost little holes where the functioning of her brain is lower than it should be. In this area, which is responsible for seeing faces and understanding who they are, and this area, which is more important for space uh, processing. And it turns out that um, she has amyloid just all over the brain in the places where it normally goes in people with Alzheimer's, in the front and the back on both sides, not specifically where the problem is. Um, but if we look at the problem here, this is the loss of function on the uh, glucose PET scan, and now we do a tau PET scan. If I flip back and forth, you'll see they look almost like mirror images of each other. It's really remarkable to see this in a living person's brain and know that that, that is the tangles of Alzheimer's that are causing the brain in those same areas not to function properly, and we, we understand that those functions are what she has problems with in her symptoms. I think it was the bottom button that I pushed. Thanks. Um, so at least with Alzheimer's, we've got this suite of molecular biomarkers that we can use to not only understand the disease, but hopefully target the uh, things we need to be measuring to see if certain kinds of treatments can change, uh, hopefully lower those problems uh, in terms of the pathologies, improve brain functioning, and so forth. Also, I don't have time to get into it, but with Diane Lucente, who's here, uh, and Steve Haggerty, we're doing some stem cell modeling uh, to try to understand more about the molecular problems in the cells in the laboratory. Um, and hopefully, all of these things will help us on our mission to not just provide better clinical care for people and educate and train the next generation, but also ultimately to develop better methods to identify these problems and treat them in people uh, living with these illnesses. And what we really hope is that with clinical trials uh, of the future, we'll be able to slow down the, the, when we institute disease-modifying therapies that we hope will be coming along before too long, and we're trying to contribute to the efforts to accelerate this, we'll be able to slow down the accumulation of pathology and delay some of these problems in brain function and ultimately help people function better for longer. That's really the ultimate goal. And because of people coming together like you and people participating in the research studies, uh, and Cindy will talk about this. Uh, we really need to continue to engage people like you and your friends and, and family and others to participate in every way possible because that's what's gonna get us closer to the day when we have effective treatments for these diseases. So thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoy this morning's program.